I'll read you the question. If you were here last week, uh, I gave you the question, questions, and uh, challenged you to do a little bit of homework. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to read this out. Uh, there seems to be a lot of confusing and misleading doctrine about events surrounding the second coming of Jesus Christ and what his return even <clears throat> is. Based on what the scriptures say and not what, not what we are traditionally told, can you please explain each of the following? Okay. So, right here, I'm just letting you know. I'm already going, hmm. I, I don't know who wrote this. It was written anonymously. There was no, no name put on it. But I'm, I'm thinking, hmm. So, if I say something that the writer doesn't agree with, am I one of those that's misleading? Hmm. Okay, God. <laughs> you got to give me the words to say. So I don't want to mislead anybody. Okay? Um, and then, 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 then it's like this great big cannon went off. Because it wasn't just one question, and it wasn't even, it's not even just three questions, because each question has sub-questions to clarify the original question. And, and then there's multiple original questions. So the first question is, what is the day of the Lord? Is it a literal single day? or a time period and events leading up to the glorious return of Jesus? What will it be like when the day of the Lord comes? That's the first questions. This is the second questions. What is the second coming, the return of Jesus Christ? What should we expect the second coming to look like and be? And then the third questions. What is the kingdom age, millennial kingdom, and what will be happening during this time, and what will it be like? Thank you for such easy questions. <laughs> so before I even get into this, I need to. There needs to be a caveat right at the beginning. Um, this is not really just an ask the pastor question. This is. This should be a lengthy, involved study. As a matter of fact. Um, in order to properly understand this question and, and to be able to give an answer, you really have to start in Genesis and, and you got to work all the way through to Revelation. Okay, because the, the entirety of this question is summed up in what is God's purpose and plan for man. Okay, and, and this question makes it seem like it's only one small part of it, but it really deals with the summation of everything that God has been working through from Genesis and, and carrying on through today all the way into the end of Revelation. Okay. So, uh, my caveat is, this is not an exhaustive answer. This is, this is going to be, um, I'm hitting some of the key highlights in this answer. Um, this is a fantastic study. I would <coughs> encourage you to dig deep and look. Don't, I always, here, here's my approach to study. Look first and see what the Word says. Look at, look at the Word. Write down some notes as you're reading down through the Word. Use a, a uh, chain index so you can go from the, the topic to the topic within the different uh, books and the passages. Um, write down questions that you have. Uh, look and see if those other scriptures answer those questions. Start developing an idea, uh, a, a conception of what scripture says first. Okay. We start at the Word. We don't end at the word. We start there. We will end there as well. Okay. So you, you come up with what you believe Scripture says. Okay. Um, because our stance is that the Bible is the inerrant word of God in its original language. Uh, I believe we have some excellent translations available to people today. Um, I'm uh, not one of those that says King James only. Uh, if you are King James only, I want to apologize. I'm not trying to step on your toes. But I would encourage you to go back and look at the original preface to the King James only. Um, because the authors of the King James said that their hope, their intent was that as more manuscripts were arrived, they'd be able to get a better translation than what they had. Um, so uh, if you are a King James only, I would ask which one. Because there have been numerous re-releases of the King James Bible from the original 1611. Okay. Setting that aside, King James is still a good translation. As a matter of fact, the new King James is an excellent translation. Okay. 
So if you have a King James Bible, I'm not telling you put it away. It's a good translation. Okay? The, the difficulty that I have as a pastor with the King James Bible is we don't talk like that anymore. We, we don't use those kind of words, and we don't use the, the ye's and the these and the thou's. Um, so, so I would encourage you, look at some of the other reputable translations. NASB is considered one of the premier translations of the Bible. The reason I don't teach out of the NASB, that we don't have those in our, our, under our seats, is because it is a little bit harder to understand, because it's a direct word-for-word -word translation. And while they did work to try and put them into the English, the, the phraseology of how we use things and putting things in the right order, sometimes it's a little bit hard to read. Okay, so we use the ESV, which really struck, I think, a good balance um, between the dynamic equivalent and the literal translation. Okay, the dynamic equivalent is rendering it in the way we would say things. Okay, and the the literal translation is just a word-for-word -word translation. So ESV or NASB, New King James, those are all good Bibles. Um, the uh, New World Translation, just stay away from. It. Okay, that's that's not a biblical translation at all. Okay, uh, I would encourage you be very cautious in uh, the message. Uh, be, be cautious of anything that is a paraphrase, okay? Because a prayer, paraphrase, by its nature, is somebody's opinion about how the passage should read, okay? So I would caution you, be careful. You can look at those, and when you're studying, look at those, and you, you can get some insight from what that author thinks the passage should say, but your, our, our root is always the word, and, and the best translation that we can get. So New King James, NASB, ESV, all of those are very good translations. So, we start with the word, we see what the word says, and then, as we get into our studies, uh, oftentimes it's helpful to see what other people have to say about the passage. Okay. So when you're looking at the, the Bible, um, you look and you come across a word and you're, you know, well, what, what, how does that work? What does that word mean? I mean, you know, we, we see the word love all throughout Scripture. And there's no less than five different words between the Hebrew and the Greek for love. Okay. And each one carries with a, a, a different emphasis and a different focus. Okay. And, and just to give you a simple point, um, in Colossians chapter 3, when Paul is talking about husbands and wives, it says that husbands should love their wives. Okay, and the word love there is agapeo. Okay, we should love unconditionally. Meaning that, that we should love them as God loves us. But then in Titus 2, when Paul is writing to the, the churches and they're telling people how they should behave, it talks, to, uh, says the older women should teach the younger women to love their husbands and their children. Okay? The love there is not unconditional love, believe it or not. You go, what? I'm off the hook! No, you're actually on the hook because you have to your, love your husband in a way that he knows you like him. Do you understand that? that? That when you love your husband, he has to walk away from that encounter, that experience, going, wow, she, she really likes me. Okay? Uh, because that's what happens. I mean, when, when we're dating... You're our greatest cheerleader. You, you, you've got it together. You're it. Okay? And, and then as we move on in, in married life, somehow or another, life intervenes and it gets ugly and we lose our greatest cheerleader. And sometimes we're not even sure our greatest cheerleader is really even cheering on our team anymore. She might be cheering for someone else. I'm not sure. All those little people that just magically appear around your house. I think she's on their team. Okay, so um, just as an example of those two different words, you're looking at agapeo and, and you're looking at phileo, okay? So two different types of love, but we look at them and we just read love, love, okay? So get a good um, word dictionary. Um, Spiro Zodiades has an excellent word study that uh, we actually have a copy in the library. I have a copy as well that Jeannie gave me. Incredible depth of research, uh, very good uh, resource material, okay? Um, there are a number of other things that you can do looking at different word studies. Uh, Strong's Concordance has a lot of uh, words in the back of it, so you can look up the number and you can look in the back and see what word was used and, and what that word 
uh, what makes up that word and, and, and what passages it's used that way. So, so we have those things. Uh, and then at the end of all of that, when you've done that, when you've done your work, then you can look and see what other people say. Okay? Because keep in mind, no matter how great a Christian the author of what you're reading was, he was still a man or she was a woman. Okay? They were still human. And, and they are working with all the flaws and failures that you have. They might know more languages. They might have had received more training, more teaching. But keep in mind, their training and teaching came from other humans. Okay? And there's no one, I have not found anyone yet in any of the writings that I've read that I agree with 100%. Okay? Um, I, I haven't. And, and there are some incredibly brilliant men that have written great things about the Bible. But I want to encourage you, when you get into the Word and study, see what the Word says first. See what the Word says second. Then look at the words that make up the Word and see what those mean. Okay? And then, after you've got that together, and, and, and keep in mind, you have the Holy Spirit in you that is teaching you, then look and see what other people say, because they might be able to open up something that you hadn't considered. You know, we all have blind areas, areas that we just don't see. So that's why I, when I'm doing my study, I write out my notes, I, I look at what I think the, the Word says, and then I start looking for what other people say. And there's a lot of times I go, oh, wow, I, I never even knew that. Uh, one of the greatest things that, that has ever happened to me is, is getting into the Jewish thinking. Because keep in mind, the majority of the Bible is written by and for Jews in their original intent. Uh, and then in the New Testament, uh, to the church, but it was written by, for the, predominantly by Jews. And so you have to understand what Jewish thinking is to get a lot out of those messages. Just like with communion, you know, Jesus was, was the, the Last Supper doing communion. He was doing the Seder dinner. And without understanding what was going on in that meal, we don't understand what the significance was of the third cup. Why did they, why did they specify the third cup? Why did they specify after the <coughs> meal he took the bread? I mean, you're, you're done eating, right? What, what, you know, was it cake? Were they, was he slicing cake and serving it? Well, if you don't understand that, you can't really get the full understanding of what's being said. So that's, a, I would just encourage you, when you study, start with the word. Trust the word first and foremost, okay? Then look in, at, at some word dictionaries, some word studies, and then at the very last of things, look and see what other people have to say. Keeping in mind that they have the same Holy Spirit that you have, okay? So, having said all that, here's some of my answers. So the first question, uh, what is the day of the Lord? Is it a literal single day or a time period leading up to the glorious return of Jesus? And what will it be like when the day of the Lord comes? The day, all the times that I have found that the word talks about the day of the Lord and it speaks about it often. Okay? Uh, I think I counted like 90 some different references for the day of the Lord. Okay? Um, every time that the word talks about the day of the Lord, it is speaking of a specific event where God directly intervened in the affairs of mankind to accomplish his purposes. Every single time that I come across that, God is doing something either against those who are opposed to him or for people that are for him or both. Okay? Um, is it a literal single day? Yes. Maybe. Okay? The, the reason I say that is I personally believe there have been numerous days of the Lord thus far. Okay? Um, we see the day of the Lord in, in writings uh, all throughout the Hebrew Bible. We see it all throughout the New Testament writings. Uh, we see events that were prophesied in the Hebrew Bible that seemed to come to pass and, and did come to pass in the writings of the Hebrew Bible and in the intertestamental period. Okay? And we see, we go, oh, okay, so okay, mark that prophecy off because that's been fulfilled. <clears throat> give you an example. Daniel writes about the abomination that causes desolation. Okay? And we know that that happened under Antiochus IV, who titled himself Epiphanes, Antiochus the God. Okay? 
Um, we know that he came into Jerusalem. We know that he came into the temple. We know that he sacrificed a pig on the brazen altar. Okay, Abomination that causes desolation. We know that there was persecution of the Jews. We know that the Jews rose up. We know that, that uh, so, so we know the abomination of desolation happened at least once. Okay. It was in direct fulfillment of what Daniel said, but it wasn't the total fulfillment of what Daniel said, because it also, <clears throat> excuse me, said that God was going to respond. Okay, well, Jesus, who comes after Antiochus, Antiochus the Fourth, he is speaking, and he says, "So when you see the abomination that causes desolation, of which Daniel spoke, okay, so we know it was fulfilled once, but we know." Jesus said that when you see it, something else is going to happen. Okay, so we know it's going to be filled again. And a lot of people say, well, yeah, of course, that was when Titus came in and, and he destroyed the temple. Or it was when Caligula came in and he erected a, an idol of Zeus and wanted to put it in the temple grounds and have people worship. And, and, and those, those could be marked as, you know, the abomination. But, but it, it says when you see these things, know that his return is imminent. Okay. And, and we see those things that happened, and yet he didn't return. Okay? We're still waiting for him to come back. So we see that, that the prophecies can be filled in more than one instance. And I, you know, some people say there's a, a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. I think this is people that are stuck in three dimensions trying to understand a... a dimensional God that is so far beyond them that they can't fathom his thinking. He tries to speak to us in words that we can understand. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of physics here. I, I'm, I, I, I'm not big into physics, but uh, Benjamin and Thaddeus and some of my kids are, and they like to talk about these things, and most of the time I just sit there and smile and go, I have no clue what they're talking about. <laughs> can, can we just get on to playing cards or something? You know, let's do something simple. Let's, let's box. Okay, so, <clears throat> but there was a, uh, did anybody here familiar with Carl Sagan? Any, anybody familiar with him? Okay, he was a, a scientist, he was a, a evolutionist, he uh, was an atheist, uh, but he did this uh, uh, video series. Uh, I would encourage you to go out to YouTube and look it up and see what he has to say. And he's talking about dimensions. Now, we are a three-dimensional being. And so really, we can't comprehend anything that is uh, even one-dimensional, much less two-dimensional, and we certainly can't comprehend anything beyond three dimensions. Because to us, you know, the, the, the first dimension, we, we say, oh, well, that would be a dot. But we have a dot, and we can look, and the dot has length and width, right? So we can't really fathom what the first dimension is. Well, we see the second dimension, and, and it's a line. Well, but we see that the line has a start and an end, and it has a width, and it would have a depth. So it, we can't really conceive of it only as two dimensions. But he talks about understanding these dimensions, and he talks about how um, if uh, you were in the third dimension and you were looking at the second dimension, uh, and it was populated by people that he calls the Flatlanders, okay, and they would not be able to perceive you, okay, because they have length, they have width, but they don't have height. So to them, if you're above them looking down on them, you don't exist because they can't look up and see you. Because all they can do is look forward and back and left and right. Okay? So if you were to try to reveal yourself to them, you would have to come down to their level. But because you exist in the third dimension, they would only see a slice of you at a time. They wouldn't be able to see what was below them, and they wouldn't be able to see what was above them. So they, they would just see slices. So he says, well, what happened if you were to take a flatlander and pick him up out of flatland and pull him up into the third dimension and have him look down on these people and then let him see what, what it looks like from your perspective and then put him back into the second dimension. What would happen? Everybody that he talked to in the second dimension would think he was possessed by demons. That, that dude was loony because he's talking about seeing things from a dimension from a direction that they don't have. You got left, you got right, you got forward, you got back. There is no up, there is no down. What is this heresy? And so Carl Sagan is talking about these things and how difficult it would be for second dimension to understand a third dimension. Well, we're in a third dimension, and God's in a dimension far, far, far beyond us. And so in order to give us some insight into who he is, 
He did things by taking people and, and showing them a different perspective and then putting them in the midst of us. And these would be the prophets and the writers of the word that saw things that even they didn't really understand, but they tried to relate to us so that we might share in, in their knowledge, if not their understanding. And, and God said, they're not getting it. What is wrong with these people? Okay? Um, so what did God do? He came down. And he put himself in our dimension in a way that we could perceive, that we could touch, that we could feel, that we could see, that we could hear, and that was Jesus Christ, okay? Who is the image of the invisible God, okay? So that being the case, we, we have physics, we see that uh, this is going on. Uh, we, we try to ascertain and understand a God that is so far beyond us, um, that it's a finite being trying to understand an infinite God, okay? so. The day of the Lord. What does all this have to do with the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord is something that I believe moves on multiple levels, but because we're stuck in, in our thinking, our linear thinking, or, or even maybe our cloud thinking, we can't quite grasp it. Um, examples of this would be how many scriptures did Jesus fulfill in his first advent here on the earth? That, that a lot of people weren't really even sure were prophecies of, of who he was. And I mean, Jeepers Crime, how is this going to work? He's got to come out of Bethlehem, but he's also got to come out of Egypt, and he's also got to come as a, as a Nazarene, from Nazareth. How, how is that going to work? All these things, how is that? And then he fulfills scriptures that I go, I didn't know that was a prophecy. I just read that the other day. I just went through I thought they were just talking to the guy that was there and, and just laying things out, and all of a sudden Jesus, oh, look, he just filled this. Okay? So, the day of the Lord being as a prophetic utterance, they're speaking of something that may come. No, not may, something that will come. We know that the day of the Lord has happened previously because we know from some of the writings in the prophets that they spoke to specific people, specific times, specific events. The fall of Assyria was called the day of the Lord. The fall of Babylon was called the day of the Lord. The fall of Jerusalem was called the day of the Lord. All of these things happened. So is it a single day? Yes. But I believe that it has been multiple single days. And I believe there is a big single day yet to come. Okay. So what is it? I don't know. Here's what I do know. Well, first, let's, let's talk about what this day is going to look like, and then I'll get back to that. Um, these are some of the descriptions, and keep in mind this is some of the descriptions, not all of them. Um, so we see that on that day, it is going to be a day of wrath and desolation, and that's from Isaiah 13, 9. It's going to be a day of clouds, according to Ezekiel 30, verse 3, and darkness, according to Joel and Amos. It will be bitter, according to Zephaniah. It'll be a day with no light, cold, or frost, and it will be unlike any other day with neither light nor darkness, according to Zechariah. And it will be a day of plagues and panic, also according to Zechariah. Okay, now, if we stop there, we could go, oh, okay, well, you know, with the fall of Jerusalem, um, really that... that when Babylonia overthrew Jerusalem, that really solved all of those. It answered all of those. It didn't answer all of those because tailing in on the end of those prophecies, there's always a how God is going to respond in mercy and grace and redemption as a result of this. Okay? And, and we see also that it couldn't have been those because in the New Testament, numerous New Testament writer, writers quoted those prophecies as things yet to come. So, did those things fulfill the prophecies? Yeah, sure they did. Okay. Were they the fulfillment of that prophecy? I don't really know, because I don't know if God intended this is a day of the Lord, and this is the day of the Lord, and this is the day of the Lord. I, God hasn't revealed that thinking to me. Okay. But I know there have been numerous things that have come up that look like they fulfilled in part, or in large part, the day of the Lord prophecies. So in the New Testament, um, we see a couple of things that, that uh, the New Testament writers write. Uh, it will be a day of darkness when the moon, moon turns to blood. That's from Acts, and he's uh, quoting Joel. Uh, it will be preceded by the revealing of the man of lawlessness, according to 2 Thessalonians. And it will come quickly, 
according to 2 Thessalonians. Uh, so what do I think about this? I think that the day of the Lord, when, when we see all of these things coming to pass, uh, I, I think it's going to be, speaking of the, the day of the Lord, and I'm going to put that all in, <clears throat> all in caps because this is the big day, I believe it's one of two days. Uh, the first one that I think this is most likely going to be uh, is when uh, we see all the nations come up against Israel. They surround Jerusalem. Uh, a, a large number of the Jews in Jerusalem will have died. Uh, the remaining Jews will call out. They will call out to God for, to be their Savior. They will acknowledge the Messiah, and the Messiah will return. And as Scripture says, he will set foot on the Mount of Olives. Okay, The Mount will be split in two. And uh, he will destroy by the sword of his mouth all of the armies gathered up against Jerusalem. Okay, that I believe is is probably the day that they're talking about. Except that we know from Scripture that the millennial reign will begin with the destruction of all of these armies. Now there are some people out there that go, well, the millennial reign isn't a literal thousand-year reign. I would disagree, and I disagree for, for one reason specifically. Um, in the book of Revelation, hang on a second, I gotta get my, make sure I get the right uh, reference. Um, I've gotten out of my notes. Um, I believe it's Revelation 6, but I might be wrong on that. Uh, it talks about the millennial reign of Jesus uh, six times in seven verses. I believe it's seven verses. It specifies 1,000 years. Okay. Usually when you see something repeated, uh, it's because you, God wants your attention on it. If it's done three times, it is of significant importance. This has been reiterated six times in just a matter of verses. I believe God is really, this is of the utmost importance. There is a literal thousand year reign that will be instituted when Jesus comes back and sets foot on the earth. Okay? Um, what will that time period look like? Uh, now I'm, I'm kind of getting into some other. Let me, let me finish this first question up real quick. Let me make sure I got... Uh, Okay, so what, what is the uh, conflict with, with me, with the little bit of doubt that I have that being the day of the Lord? The conflict that I have is at the end of the thousand years, Satan who is bound in the pit will be loosed and set free and he will go through the earth and he will gather the nations and they will rise up against God and, and this will be the final battle. This will be the end of all things as far as sin and, and the devil goes and, and they will destroy all of the armies, and the devil will be bound up and he will be cast in the lake of fire where the, the false prophet and the antichrist are. Okay. I don't know why God is doing a thousand year reign. I don't know why there's gonna be another battle after that battle. I, I, I don't understand God's thinking behind this, but I know he has a plan and a purpose in it. And I don't need to know. Okay. All, so many times we want to know things that our brains are not equipped for. Well, if, if God, would, he would just give me some understanding. He's given us understanding. He's given us his word. He's given us everything we need for life and godliness. So, so we have everything we need. A lot of times we ask questions and stuff that really if God gave us the answer to, our brains would explode. Okay? We just drop into a, a, a glistening pile of ooze. Okay? Because we're, we are not intended to know those things. So um, what do I think about... The day of the Lord, I believe that it will either be the literal second coming of Jesus Christ when he sets foot on the earth, or at the end of the thousand year reign, when he destroys to the utmost and, and for eternity those in opposition to him. One of those two, those two days. Um, some people say that it's a time period leading up to, um, I, I've looked at that and I, I have the same problem with that that I have with the seven days of creation. Are they literal days or are they, are they figurative days? Or was God speaking uh, 
as in, and, and the, like the first day, is it really, was it thousands of years that all of this was done on the first day and then thousands of years on the second day? Unless scripture gives us a reason that we should read it as allegorically or metaphorically or any of the other goricles, we take it at its word, okay? And, and if we start there, and if we would just be that simple with the reading and, and the understanding of the word, I think we find a lot of freedom in that. Okay? The only time that we need to look at that in any other direction is when it seems to contradict other parts of the word. Okay? Because a word doesn't contradict itself. All right? So that's why in my simple faith and my simple understanding, I believe that it's going to be one day. I, I think that it's going to be a specific day, but I don't know that, that there's going to be only one. Maybe God's speaking of both of these as being the day of the Lord because he's going to resolve an issue here and he's going to resolve an issue there. And both of those would definitely be called the day of the Lord because he's going to do some incredible things. Okay, so the second question. Oh, goodness. All right, I'm going to speed up here a little bit. What is the second coming, the return of the Christ, uh, and what should we expect the second coming to look like? Well, I kind of covered that already. Uh, the first thing that you need to know is that the second coming, he is actually going, it's going to be like his first coming. He's actually going to walk on the earth. Okay? He's not going to be a spirit moving around and we're going to have to guess. He's going to be here. He's going to be in our midst. Now, the, the crazy thing about this is what is it going to look like? Well, from whose perspective? I think from our perspective, we're going to see the back of Jesus on the horse, and we're going to see the enemy arrayed out against him, and we're going to see him speak the word, and we're going to see the enemy do it. Because we're going to be behind him. We're going to be coming with him. All right? Now, if you're not behind him and you're not with him, it's going to look a whole lot different. But you're going to see the front of him, and, and it's, not going to be, it's not going to be like, yeah, it's going to be like, ah! <laughs> okay, so what is it going to look like? I, I think scripture makes it very clear that it is going to be a time of war, it's going to be a time of ruin, it's going to be a day of wrath, it's going to be a day of blood, it's going to be a day of darkness. Uh, several times in, in reference to the day of the Lord it says, why are you looking forward to this? Don't you understand that it's going to be a horrific day? Yes, but it's also going to be a glorious day. Okay, mm -hmm. so what is it going to look like? I think it's going to look like God putting things back in order to the way he desired them to be. <coughs> setting the stage, if you will, uh, to usher in the, the new heaven and the new earth. Okay? Uh, setting things right. So, um, what should we expect? One of the things that we as Americans need to do is we need to get our focus off of what's going on in Washington, D.C., or Helena, or Hamilton, or we need to, to shift our focus, and we need to look at the focus of where God has placed the focus of the entire earth, and that would be Israel. Amen. Okay? We need to understand what's going on in Jerusalem in light of Scripture. We get so caught up, in, and quite honestly, the, the news in the U.S. does not cover a lot of what's going on in Israel. We don't see a lot of what's happening there. You've got to go outside CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, uh, Fox News, you've you got to go outside, you've got to look at other sources, uh, take a look at Jerusalem Post, there's a number, um, Amir Sar Sarfati, how do you say his name, Sarfati, Sarfati, Sarfati. Um, he does regular updates with things that are going on in Israel, mostly because a lot of times he's there, and he understands, he's read the word, he's read the completion of the word, and he knows how these things fit into the puzzle, and, and he gives good insight, so, um, uh, Take a look at, what is this thing called? It's Beyond Israel? Be Behold. Behold Israel. Um, so take a look at some of the things that he has to say. But get your focus off of what we think is so so apocalyptic here in the United States because really we're, we're just a little sideshow. You know, we're like the 56 <coughs> clowns that get out of the car and run around in circles. The real action is taking its center stage and that's Israel. Okay? That's where everything of significance is happening. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that that we're not a part of that, and that we won't be a part of that. It just means that um, we're not really the focus of what's happening. Okay. So, um, uh, what should we expect the second coming to look like? Uh, my theology, my doctrine, 
is that um, by the time Jesus comes back the second time, we will have already been with him, whether we died or were raptured. Um, so we, we will come from the perspective of heaven coming down to earth. Um, we will see him take care of business in Israel, and we will see him set up a millennial kingdom in Jerusalem. Okay. The son of David will sit on the throne for that thousand years. Uh, at the end of that thousand years, um, you know, it's almost like the, the, the clock has started. Uh, Jesus reigns for a thousand years, and then we're watching, we're waiting for New Jerusalem to come down. We're, we're watching, we're waiting for the dwelling place of God will be with man. Uh, we are looking forward to those things. Now, outside of the believers, uh, it's going to be ugly. Uh, because God is going to pay back in full uh, everything that is owed him. Okay? And, and he, will, he will render... Uh, the day of wrath to those that have rejected him, that have come up against him, and come up against his holy mount, which is Jerusalem and Israel, Mount Moriah, Mount Zion. That's the place that God has put his name. Okay? So, so God is going to make things right there. The third question, um, what is the kingdom age, the millennial kingdom, what will be happening during this time, and what will it be like? You know, it, it, Scripture doesn't really talk a whole life, lot about what will be going on other than to say that Jesus, uh, the millennial reign, the, the millennial kingdom, the kingdom age will be that thousand-year period from his setting foot on earth until the release of Satan from, from the, the pit. He will be set loose. He will gather up all of the people that over that thousand years have gone, mm, I don't know about this. I'm, I'm not really convinced that we should follow this guy that just wiped out all of the other, all the people of the earth that rejected him, I, I'm thinking we should go with this other guy, you know, the dragon, and, 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 and he's going to gather them up. Uh, in that time period, um, we know that peace will be on the earth. Well, what's amazing is we have no clue what that's going to look like. We, we have no understanding what that's going to look like. Now, uh, is this just peace between nations? I think that's part of it. Is it going to be peace between people? I'm not convinced of that because obviously sin is going to still be at work because if it were not at work, there wouldn't be anybody gathering with Satan at the end of all time, uh, at the end of the millennial reign. Um, so, so there's got to be sin at work and, and that means that, you know, we're, we're still going to be doing, you know, we're, we're still going to be doing stuff like that. Uh, I chose her because I didn't think she'd get up and hit me. <laughs> um, so I, I know that it will be a time of peace between the nations because the righteous ruler will be on earth, but I, I think sin will still be active in the, in the earth. Uh, but, you know, having the manifest presence of God in our, our, our midst, we've already had it. And we still killed it. Okay, so, so I think sin will be at work Otherwise, there would be nobody left to stand with Satan when, when he was set loose. Okay, so um, uh, we know that the nations will go up to Jerusalem. Uh, we know specifically it says uh, that they will celebrate the, the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, one of the prophecies specifically says that they will come up and they will celebrate. Uh, we know that uh, judgment will be passed on the kingdoms in the Valley of Judgment. Um, uh, and we know that, that Jesus will sit on the throne of David. Okay, What all that's going to look like, I don't know. But I think it's going to be better than what we got now. Mm -hmm. All right? So, uh, for whoever did this, I apologize that I, I, it's not more in-depth. Um, I know at some point we're actually going to do a, a study <coughs> on the end times. We're going to get into some eschatology and see what Scripture has to say about it. It's going to be nowhere near as in-depth as the study the ladies just completed on Revelation. How many years, Jeannie? Five years. <laughs> I think my record is, is like two on any one subject. So um, it won't be that in depth, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a teacher, not a preacher. I want to get in, I want to break it apart, I want to see what makes it work, I want to put it back together again and make it go. Okay? And so when, when I get into the Word, you know, with Colossians, we were lucky if we got through an entire verse when we did the book of Colossians. Lucky or not lucky, I don't know. 
because there's so much significance. I, I, I've said it before, I will continue saying it. There's not a single word in the Bible that is there by accident. Mm -hmm. Every word has a purpose.